Okay, hi, I'm uh, Scott Jones. I'm uh, acting director of Electronic Frontiers Georgia. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. And um, I want to welcome you tonight to our, our presentation. It's uh, Earn It Act. Uh, is it, could it possibly be an end run around encryption or could it discourage us from using encryption at all? Uh, you know, what is going on and what is the relationship to encryption and really what is the Earn It Act? Uh, in the first place. Um, our speaker tonight is Joe Mullen from the EFF. We're very happy to have Joe um, visiting us again, if, if only virtually. And um, so let's see, we should be ready to go. Go ahead and take it away, Joe. Okay, thanks a lot for having me. And yeah, one of the things that is maybe a silver lining to all these virtual events we've been having the past couple of years is that it enables me to talk to groups like yours that are really interested in earn it and how we can protect encryption for everyone and really put some meaning behind phrases like, you know, privacy should be a human right. Um, so I'm happy to talk to you guys about this. I am a senior policy analyst on EFF's activism team, and I've been working on earn it since we first heard about it. Uh, well, since a couple of months after we first heard about it in January of 2020. Um, so, Tonight, let's talk a little bit about uh, what is the Earn It Bill? Why does it keep coming back? Uh, and how could it affect encryption? And why do we need to fight it? Because at EFF, we definitely think we need to fight it. It's not a good idea. It never has been. And we intend to keep on fighting against it. And a whole lot of people agree with us. Um, but it's, it's a battle. So I'm going to start with a little bit of uh, history. So. The Earn It Bill was introduced in 2020. Uh, we first heard about it in January of 2020 when a draft bill was basically leaked to the press. And in its original form in 2020, the Earn It Bill would have created a commission um, that would have been dominated by law enforcement that it was called and still is called the National Commission on Online Child Exploitation Prevention. Uh, and it would have created a series of best practices uh, around preventing online child exploitation. And it would have also given the commission a lot of power to, uh, and, and that basically it would have stripped away key legal protections for companies that didn't follow those best practices. So this commission would have had an incredible amount of power um, to, you know, essentially regulate the internet. And it was it was very much a law enforcement uh, dominated commission. We could get into kind of how the commission was uh, composed, which actually hasn't hasn't changed that much. It's a 19 person commission. Um, but I'm going to kind of I want to get us up to where the debate is today. The commission has become a lot less important. Um, because of our activism against the bill, uh, the sponsors of the bill have had to change a lot of things about it, including downgrading the role of this commission and making all of these best practices to now essentially be, um, you know, tr truly best practices. They're recommendations and they don't carry the force of law anymore. But uh, I think it's, it's important to know about how this bill was originally created because some of the ideas and intentions behind the bill really haven't changed that much. So in 2020, there was this, um, it, it was formed around this idea of a commission and the commission, essentially companies that didn't follow the rules of the commission would have lost their key legal protections under uh, Section 230. So what is what is Section 230? It's a part of what was once called the Communications Decency Act, but it's a critical uh, internet law that essentially says, you're not responsible for the speech of other people online. So you're responsible for your own speech and your own actions, but if you run something as big as Facebook or Twitter, or as small as a small interest website about knitting or cars or politics or whatever, you are not responsible for what all those users say in the forums. If they say something that is defamatory 
or invade someone's privacy, then the appropriate target for a lawsuit is the, um, the user who created that content, not the person who runs the online forum. Um, and there are some important exceptions. First of all, uh, it doesn't cover federal criminal law at all, uh, Section 230. So you can be federally prosecuted as the owner of a forum um, and Section 230 is not a protection against that. And there's other important exceptions too, like uh, intellectual property violations are not covered by Section 230. So if a bunch of users on your small web forum infringe copyright, you can get in trouble for the behavior of the users, even if you didn't do it yourself. Um, but that's a very basic outline, but that is the nature of the, the hammer that the law was wielding. It was gonna strip away those protections. And without those protections, it can become uh, very hard to operate online um, without, you know, in some way, very closely watching your users or censoring your users or just limiting what the ways they can communicate. And that's why one of the, you know, the key, uh, a really important book that was written, written about Section 230 is, um, notice I've read it, it's by Jeff Kossa, the 26 words that created the internet. It's, it's hard to exaggerate the importance of Section 230 in creating the internet as we know it today. Now, of course, it's a lot, the internet's a lot bigger <laughs> than today, and the, especially the biggest services have become not just big, but you know, problematically big in a lot of ways. So that's some background that we all know, but that's it's important to understand that was the hammer that the law was going to use was to strip away Section 230 protections for websites that didn't follow the commission's rules. But we said this, we immediately saw this was going to be a big problem for both free speech and for privacy and encryption. Well, why was that? Well, at the time, um, the attorney general was Bill Barr who had made pretty clear his views on encryption, um, which is that he thought law enforcement should have special access to those messages. He didn't like the idea that there was a, you know, an uncrackable safe is sometimes a law enforcement metaphor that gets used, that they thought that, well, if they have the, um, if they have the proper judicial warrant, or maybe even if they don't, they should be able to, uh, there shouldn't be a message online that's totally out of the reach of law enforcement. Um, and this has been an ongoing battle in the crypto wars, which EFF has been involved in going back to 1990. So I say Bill Barr, I mean, he was, a, he was certainly a proponent at this point of view, but it's not been limited to him. It's not been limited to one party. And um, we have FBI directors going back uh, a good generation now that have said things like going dark or you know, implying or stating that law enforcement is becoming impossible because they can't get easy access to certain encrypted messages, uh, despite the fact that federal, law, federal, local, and state law enforcement have access to unprecedented amounts of digital data and unprecedented ways to, in fact, break into devices and other things like that. So, um, we thought that the best practices would pretty clearly include a way to provide special access because law enforcement had been talking about that for, like I said, uh, a generation. So we created a campaign and I'll, I will show you now one of the links for our 2020 um, internet campaign once I find it. And um, So this is an example, an important example of the activism we started doing at the beginning of Earn It. So this is from March of 2020, and it's it's a link to our action. Um, this is after we got the text of the bill. We said the Earn It bill is the government's plan to scan every message online, that they should have to get special access. And they said, well, we're doing this just for scanning for what they're calling CSAM, child sexual abuse material which uh, in an earlier period was, it's, kind of, it's a new term for child pornography. And um, in fact, one of the aspects 
of the Earn It Bill is to change a lot of the terminology in the law from child pornography, which is a legal phrase uh, for these images going, going way back, to child sexual abuse material. Uh, we don't have an issue with that linguistic change. Language changes, that is not in any way the part of the bill that has spurred EFF uh, concern and activism. Uh, but I want you to know that, that that term and what they're talking about. So the idea behind this bill was that um, companies should follow the best practices and if they don't, they would lose Section 230 protections. Um, But we said, you know, you can't have uh, an internet where messages are, are screened on Moss and also have end-to-end -end encryption. They just don't go together, even though the folks who want to scan the messages have um, come up with a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, there's always kind of a new terminology or strategy. At one point, we were talking about uh, having ghosts in people's messaging software. And then the thing that is really being talked about a lot now is some version of what's called client-side scanning. And I'm also going to put a, an important EFF link about client-side scanning in there. So what client-side scanning is, is it's like a piece of software that would be on your phone or on your computer that would um, look at content and look for certain content and then issue some kind of report to a third party and in a very strictly technical sense it could do this without breaking encryption in a technical sense which is important because um you know it, it's really a linguistic trick it's it's not that different than saying well you uh you know let's say um you know, two users here, uh, you know, Scott, you could talk to someone over an end-to-end uh, uh, -end encrypted message. My only condition is that I want my friend to be in the room with you and look over your shoulder while you write the message, only to look for certain words or certain images that would obviously be of grave concern to everyone. Um, and we all agree that that needs to be checked for, but it's still an encrypted message. Well, EFF's view on that is it's just not an encrypted message. It breaks the promise of end-to-end -end encryption, even if in a very technical sense, that is still an encrypted message. You couldn't, you couldn't collect it or read it in transit, right? So it, we became pretty confident that this was what the commission was intending to um, impose. The bill changed as a result of overwhelming um, public opposition. Just from EFF site, we had hundreds of thousands of messages that were sent to Congress, and we had allies that were working on this as well. So the bill went through a big change, and it, it then it changed to the form that it is mostly in today. Um, so they added a, and the Senate Judiciary Committee had a hearing on the bill. They added an amendment meant to protect encryption, basically to say that you could not be sued or prosecuted for offering an end-to-end -end encrypted product. Uh, we felt the way that was written really wasn't sufficient. And they also made a big change to the enforcement structure of the bill. They said the commission would just be recommendations, but they empowered states, so all 50 states and also US territories, they empowered those legislatures to create and enforce laws that could go around Section 230, so essentially regulate internet speech, as long as those laws had to do with CSAM, as long as they had to do with child sexual abuse material. And that's largely the form that the bill is in today. It is, instead of directly saying you can't encrypt a message. It says to the states, you're empowered to create and enforce laws. And I'm gonna get the exact language here. Um, that, so any charge in it, there's a section that says, any charge in a criminal prosecution brought against a provider of an interactive computer service under state law regarding the 
advertisement, promotion, presentation, distribution, or solicitation of child sexual abuse material. And so our concern is that that leaves a lot of uh, bandwidth for saying things like, well, if you allow users to communicate, if you don't check, essentially, if you don't create a proactive type of checking for this material, then you're in trouble and you could be prosecuted or sued. Well, so what, well, why do we think this? Why don't we think just that, well, maybe we should, you know, that the sponsors of this bill are saying that companies aren't doing enough to look for this material and they're not helping law enforcement, right? They're saying they're not doing their jobs in the way we want to help with law enforcement. Well, that's, that's just not really true. I mean, I can't speak for every company, but there's a legal regime out there. CSAM is completely illegal. There is very clear and strict laws in place. It is not illegal to view it, to produce it, to distribute it. It's a very serious crime and the punishments are, are quite serious too. Um, and Section 230 is not a <laughs> protection from those laws. It's not a protection from federal criminal law at all, actually. Um, so our concern is that they would really try to mandate some type of proactive uh, checking. And I would say that now I, what I'd like to do is maybe talk for a minute about what has changed in the new version of Earn It that we saw it come back in 2022. One of the big changes is the sponsors have, they've kind of laid their cards on the table and they've told us essentially what they want to do. They not only did they put the law back in the same form, but they also uh, distributed with it a myths and facts document, which I will, um, here's our, I want to share our blog post against the new Earn It Act. This is from 2022 a blog post written by me and um, with help from my team. It's back, senators want the earn it bill to scan online messages. It's about how we could have new internet rules from, from Juno to Jackson. Really, it's just a, uh, all 50 states would be empowered to do that. They'll do it under the guidance, they're not mandated, but under the guidance of this law enforcement dominated commission. And, um, in this interesting myths and facts document, the sponsors kind of admit what they're after. Uh, you know, it, in the previous iteration of the bill, um, there was a little, you know, we, we were making to some degree an inference based off their statements. We felt we had very strong grounds for it, but an inference about what would happen right and to some degree we still are because they this is not a bill that bans encryption outright why doesn't it just do that if that's what they want because the sponsors of the bills were the bill were they're smart and if they tried to just ban encryption there'd be a major constitutional problem with that and also i don't really think they get that far because the public would see what they're doing and there would be an enormous outcry against it so they um, are just empowering states to do this. And they kind of are hoping, well, we'll think that the something good will happen. Um, but what they want to happen is kind of given away in this uh, myths and facts document where they, you know, uh, not only do they talk about uh, scanning messages, they talk about how they believe any tech company has plenty, quote, plenty of tools and options available to prevent this crime without hindering their options or creating significant costs. So no significant cost. Then the next bullet point is the detection, report, prevention, and reporting of CSAM is one of the most easily addressed abuses and crimes in the digital era. There are readily accessible and often free software and cloud services such as photo DNA to automate the detection of known CSAM material and report it to NCMEC. That NCMEC is the uh, NCMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. It is a quasi-government agency 
that was created by Congress in the 1980s, and it is the um, the organization that uh, runs the cyber tip line. So if you encounter CCM, you are mandated to report it, it to uh, NCMEC, and um, most of the information in their database comes from law enforcement agencies, and NCMEC is also the group that would alert law enforcement uh, agencies to take action about the database. Um, so it's verified, that's considered verified CCM if it's in that database. Um, so, I mean, you know, in this, I think what's happened in this iteration, among other things, is um, they have sort of said that they do expect proactive scanning. They want to install a type of proactive scanning. They have said falsely that it's free and easy to proactively scan user messages. And they've suggested the kind of software that they want to scan user messages. And again, what's the purpose? It is to um, compare them all to images in a government database um, that is not auditable. Um, so, you know, this, this raises a lot of concerns. It's a, it is just at the end of the day, it's a form of mass surveillance. And um, in the US, we already have, we have this database that can't really be checked or audited that then all user messages will be checked against. But uh, the US is not gonna be the only country that engages in this strategy. And I'll go more into the, the international ramifications of this um, in a minute, but I wanna leave a moment for questions before I kind of skip to the next section. But, um, you know, authoritarian countries are also, that already, some of which already have regimes of surveillance and censorship in place online, are going to want uh, equivalent privileges to this. So they will also want client-side uh, scanners um, to compare to their own databases that, that will be run by their own organizations. And um, so those are, that's kind of where it stands right now. And then let me, let me talk briefly about where the politics of, of Earn It are right now. Um, and I should mention, actually, importantly, last fall, uh, we also saw a move by Apple, uh, which was pressured by NCMEC. NCMEC has its own uh, advocates and lobbyists who do a lot of work to get companies to scan and run images against their database to submit to them reports. They also really pushed hard to get Apple to install a form of client-side scanning software on um, every device and Apple announced that it planned to do that and we also opposed that said that Apple was betraying its promise to users Apple has said that privacy is a human right they've put that up in billboards not just in the US but in Germany in Dubai uh, in countries where you can get in all kinds of trouble that you might not get into in the US, depending on what's on your phone, and that they should keep that promise to users, and that installing a client-side scanner for, for any purpose when you're reporting it to a, a government agency is, is not appropriate, and it's a violation of the promise of end-to-end -end encryption. So at least for now, Apple has withdrawn that plan, but the reason I bring that up and earn it coming right after it is that it really does seem like we're in an era of, um, you know, increasing pressure uh, from governments where the plan is to use private companies to really put overwhelming pressure on them to be an intermediary and to have them um, essentially not use effective end-to-end -end encryption or to give some kind of out, some kind of scanner uh, before the encrypted message gets transmitted or after or both where the government gets to do a check against their own database. And uh, we said that that's just, you know, you can, they, you can have a million blue ribbon panels uh, about how to combine a universal scanning system with end-to-end -end encryption, but 
you know, our position isn't going to change. You can also have a million blue ribbon panels about um, how to raise the dead. But the question would be, you know, how effective is it going to be? <laughs> You're not really going to find a way to do that. And as we've said, uh, you know, just dozens and hundreds of times in EFF blog posts, there is no backdoor uh, to encrypted messages that works only for the good guys. It always will also work for criminals. It will work for the authoritarian governments. It will work for the rogue employee in a position of privilege at one of these companies. And um, so it's better to just maintain the integrity of end-to-end -end encryption. So I think those are some of the, uh, anyhow, the, let me give you the short version of what happened in 2022. Uh, we opposed the bill, I should say, I, I'm skipping some political things here that are important. In 2020, uh, we created a lot of opposition to the bill. It was still voted out of the Senate Judiciary Committee, but it never went to the Senate floor and it was never voted on by any House committee. Now in 2022, uh, faced with a similar version of the bill, um, we opposed it again and we've had the same result, which is that it got passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and but it has not received a vote on the House floor and has not received a hearing in a House committee. And we expect that at least in this Congress, uh, it won't advance. But it's come back, it's of concern to us. Um, the sponsors aren't gonna stop trying. And so I wanted to kind of go over with this group and it looks like we have a pretty small group, so I'd be happy to answer some questions. You guys might be interested in some of the, the inside um, baseball, as it were, about this. Um, but, it, it's kind of a different political dynamic this year uh, in, in both good and bad ways, but we are sort of in the same position um, with this bill. Uh, when it was passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee this year, which happened um, in the last several weeks, uh, there were several um, senators that expressed some real concerns, which we were happy to see. Uh, sometimes that's how <laughs> opposition pays off in the Senate. The Senate is a, is a strange beast that I'm still only <laughs> learning about how it really operates. Um, we were happy to hear uh, some senators in the committee say some critical things. We wished it would have gotten them to the right position, which was actually to vote no on the bill. Uh, we didn't quite get there, but in the world of lobbying, sometimes these expressions of concern uh, are important because they, they are ways of senators indicating to their colleagues that they're not gonna be ready to push this over the finish line and that it's not right for a floor vote. So some examples of the opposition we heard uh, this time around were, you know, uh, Senator Padilla of California, who's a relatively new senator, um, took Kamala Harris's seat, said that he was concerned about possible effects on the LGBTQ community. He wanted to see that stuff addressed. Senator John Ossoff from Georgia actually introduced EFF's opposition letter into the record, along with a coalition letter uh, from the Center for Democracy and Technology which had, I think, 60 plus uh, human rights and civil rights groups listed on it. Um, so we, have a, we actually have a broader uh, coalition of opposition this year than we did in 2020. Uh, Senator Lee is a Republican from Utah, said he I talked about several amendments he'd like to see before the bill moves. Um, and Senator Coons from Delaware, a Democrat, said that he saw it as still having some problems with encryption that he wanted to see fixed before it moved to the floor. Senator Booker, a Democrat from New Jersey, also raised less specific concerns that he still had about the bill. Um, and so that is where it stands right now. I have a few thoughts about some of the things we're seeing internationally, but before I do that, I've talked a lot. So I actually, because we have a small group here, I want to make sure we have a chance to be interactive and I thought I would stop there and ask if there are questions at this point about this bill or EFF's work on the bill. Um, 
love to take a few and I'm going to scan over the chat, which I haven't been looking at. But, um, yeah, and feel free to use the chat or or to turn on your microphone if you want to, to ask the question uh, on the microphone. We have a pretty small group tonight. Yeah, I mean, George asks, how is encryption online different than writing something on a paper with a secret code? Law enforcement can't make me reveal what the code is if it's evidence against me and I assert my Fifth Amendment rights. I mean, yeah, there's, so I should clarify, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a policy analyst and I work with my activism team, so nothing I say is lawyerly, but it comes from my experience working around the law in in both my career at EFF and my career as a, as a tech and legal journalist before I was at EFF. Uh, yeah, in general, you know, there's really sharp limits on the way that you can be forced to testify against yourself, right? And that includes things like giving up a password to your computer or the password to your phone. Um, and now that's entering a new and complicated area, right, with biometrics. Like, is the law saying, you know, that the police can't make you give up your password the same as you know, whether they could use your, your thumbprint or your, your face image. And that's getting into kind of new territory that our, that our lawyers handle. But um, yeah, in general, I mean, there is no law, right, saying we have to break encryption. That's really important to know. And so that helps you frame where this debate stands, which is, one, we're seeing an overwhelming political pressure campaign right, to get the companies to break it. So, because they can't just pass a law saying, break the darn encryption, right? There are multiple constitutional problems with that. And like I said, I don't think it would get that far because the public would express outrage, would see what Congress is, is doing. I don't think the public would accept that. Um, and so in some ways, you know, it's like our, the law of encryption, right, which is that you are allowed to use it, um, you're allowed to write code, you're allowed to write strong encryption, you're allowed to use math to protect your communications, is the status quo. So it's it's one of these fights where it's there's a lot of laws that need to change in our society. Uh, from, from We all have opinions about what should, there ought to be a law, and EFF has established positions about some things that should change. But you're allowed to use encryption right now, and it's it's a good way to protect yourself. So in some ways, our fight to protect encryption is a fight to not change the law. We don't need a law to protect encryption, actually. Um, and so EFF does other kinds of activism around encryption like we do. We have, uh, you know, surveillance self-defense. Uh, and, you know, when, when world politics or situations change, uh, we write about sometimes the best way to protect yourself. Like when there were Protests in 2020, we've had a couple posts up about the, the war in Ukraine. Even though we're not geopolitical experts, we have wanted to let um, users connected to those areas of the world know what they need to do to protect themselves. So, um, yeah, it's it's not that different, right, than, than using a code on a piece of paper, which is something that you would do to protect your privacy and have a private conversation. We've always felt that the right metaphor, right, for encryption is not this thing of, well, you know, they're just safe with a bunch of documents in it, and why shouldn't the cops be able to get access to that with any tools they have, just like they could with a safe? The real metaphor is um, it's a private conversation. So, you know, there's no doubt that the police would be able to solve more crimes if they, they we're able to record every private conversation we're having in our own homes, but it's not worth it. We all know it's not worth it, right? I mean, the damage is much greater than the benefit. So um, I have to be careful about how I use metaphors, but uh, you know, the, we need to have a way to have private conversations in the world, both online and offline. It's important for 
democracy and it's important just for human culture to create new art to create new writing new thoughts you know um that you know we don't need uh the, the wrong way to frame the debate is like do you have you know well do you have something to hide right well you know no but i mean i've been a journalist and uh it's not anyone's business what the the first second third and fourth drafts of a story i worked on that were never published <laughs> that were only communications between me and my editor that might have had things that a lot of things that we agreed needed to be changed um you know just like the you know we've all written things and and i think thought better of them even even messages to friends or family members you know i don't want to send the first version of this uh, maybe i shouldn't send this at all uh or something i want to be kept very private just between a couple members of my family and um that's how the world should change and the the need to fight crimes even terrible crimes like uh csam it, it doesn't it's not enough of an excuse to um to watch us all all the time there are ways to fight those crimes and it's it's unfortunate that this is that these crime kind of crimes against children are being used in a way that's somewhat cynical here um because we saw some of the same stuff really frankly being used around te when terrorism was kind of the big reason why uh encryption had to be broken and that frankly didn't work like and you look just at the example of apple you know eff was protesting in favor of apple actually back in 2016 when they wouldn't break encryption for all users when the fbi wanted to get into at that time it was the san bernardino shooting and that the fbi wanted some special access to that shooter's phone which they already had and it turned out access to um and you know the rhetoric over the years has changed um so we go back to some of the questions here. Should I just address the questions in the channel or if someone wants to ask? I'll... Yeah, I wanted to, to go back with uh, George Hampton's first question about how is uh, encryption online different than writing something on paper? And I think, you, I think you mentioned it, but I just wanted to emphasize it. Again, one of the biggest differences is the private third party that acts as the intermediate as the intermediary. And that would be the social media company or uh, some other company, maybe a platform provider or something like that. And that party isn't covered by the constitution because the constitution applies to the government. So I think we're in a situation where we're trying to figure out, we used to have, when, whenever we were having the conversation about privacy and our rights in general, there were two people in the room. There was the, there was the citizen and there was the government. And now we have a third person in the room and that's a third party that is private in general, it's almost always private and uh, uh, corporate. Um, and what is their relationship and uh, to uh, the other two? And it is kind of a modifier um, to how our rights work. Uh, and so I think yep. that this is the big debate here is now that there's this, this third presence in the room, how does that affect our rights and how does it affect the Constitution? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, and that's why the that question of intermediaries, you know, that is kind of the question because we all experience the online world through intermediaries. So what, how do they behave and what are their rights and responsibilities that ends up affecting us all as users? And that's why we need, it's important. And, you know, the companies that do what we view as pro user and pro privacy moves like, use end-to-end -end encryption, um, we will support that. And, uh, you know, there's, there have been many instances where um, EFF has, you know, praised a company from a privacy point of view and criticized them from, say, an intellectual property point of view and vice versa. You can think a lot of examples of that just with big companies like, like Google and Apple. Um, but that question of, what are who are the intermediaries and how do they behave is critical 
And on this issue of you know scanning messages, a big player in the room here is Facebook, now Meta, but I'm just going to say Facebook because then everyone knows what I'm talking about. Um, but you know they are they own WhatsApp. WhatsApp is encrypted end to end, and they are trying to integrate their messengers and like Facebook Messenger and I guess Instagram messaging would be their two other types of messengers. Um, and they have said that they are committed to end-to-end -end encryption, which we've said is a good thing, and we want them to stand by that promise. Um, at the same time, Facebook's non-encrypted messaging systems scan a massive amount of user messages right now. And NICMIC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, has really um, planted a lot of misleading information based on the enormous number of tips that they get from largely from one company's automated scanners. Um, so NICMIC has said things, and they, they have managed to get a story about this on the front page of the New York Times, which is kind of amazing. Um, that they get, you know, over 20 million um, reports a year and that there's just this explosion of child abuse material on the internet. The truth is, we don't really know what's going on there. What we do know is that Facebook installed scanning software on all user messages on that feature because Nick Mick and the government requested it, and they used a broad definition of CSAM, and they started sending millions and millions of reports. Those report numbers are worldwide, by the way. There's this the overwhelming majority are from outside the US. And what was going on with those scans? Well, we've learned more about that too. That's another thing that's changed since 2020. What's going on with those scans is they're inaccurate. I'm going to post a link in the channel right now that's actually from Facebook's research group. So they took a look at, um, it's very hard to do these studies, you can imagine, for a lot of reasons. They took a look at some of the material that they were sending to NICMIC, a sample of it, and they found that 75% of it was what they called non malicious. So, i.e., not really CSAM in the way that the public is thinking about it, okay? So let me just read. I don't, I, you know, at EFF, we're very careful where we tread here. So we're not child safety experts. We don't know all the details of that field. We have allies in that field who we work with, but it's not our field. So I'm just going to read directly from the Facebook report here. But they found that more than 75% of the material that they flagged and sent to NICNIC was in these three categories of non-malicious users. So unintentional offenders, example, user shares a CSAM meme of a child's genitals being bitten by an animal because they think it's funny. Apparently something that happens millions of times around the world. Um, very bad taste, uh, but not malicious CSAM, the way that people think of it. Minor non-exploitative users, for example, two 16-year-olds who send sexual imagery to each other. They know each other from school and are currently in a relationship. And the third example is situational risky offenders, which may be a user has received CSAM that depicts a 17-year-old. They didn't know that that makes it CSAM, and they reshare it unknowingly. Um, all those situations, you could argue, are bad. I'm really not going to get into that, but I think it's concerning that we are faced with multiple government agencies telling us that they're looking for the worst of the worst, and the evidence is, um, it, it's an assertion that's low on evidence. To the extent that we do have evidence from things like this Facebook study, they are, it's not an accurate scanning system. And they're making it sound like there's just this explosion of um, online crime. The explosion is an explosion of reports, and they created the explosion.
and uh, it's not a reason to watch to watch everyone. I want to just briefly say on the international front, there's also it's this is happening starting to happen in multiple countries around the world. Um, in the UK, they're paving the way for what's called an online safety act, which we're concerned will have an anti-encryption component to it. Again, the strategy is going to be to pressure private companies to do it. This is a blog post we put up about a weird uh, advertising campaign in the UK to make people turn against encryption and actually convince people that encryption is bad. Uh, I don't think that's going to work, but we wanted to call that out as uh, something that's happening. Um, here is actually a, this is, if you want to get an idea of the ex extent of our, um, this is, we, we have a nice letter against that that's reflective of our growing, what, sorry, I just posted the same link twice. Here's a, a letter we, that responded to that UK ad campaign. The letter wasn't written by us, but we signed it, and it's just a, there. there's also an increasingly large coalition of groups that are ready to fight for encryption. So we have allies not just in the US but abroad too, and that is really good. And that's, that's a bigger coalition than in 2020, so I think that's also changed the landscape. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to flag about the international angle is this last blog post I'll put here, which is that we have heard that there is going to be a proposal coming from the EU Commission, the European Union Commission, um, that could make government scanning of user messages and photos mandatory throughout the European Union. And again, the excuse is they have to look for CSAM everywhere. Um, we're not sure that this is going to happen. The, the proposal, as it is described right now, is in a kind of a very vague, just a few sentences. It's not clear that, that it will mandate that. And the rollout of the official language of the proposal has now been delayed until possibly May, which is, which is probably a good sign because it means that um, they are listening to concerns from EFF and, and related groups. But yeah, there are, it's, you know, there's governments in multiple states that seem to be kind of pushing in the same direction. And this idea that uh, really getting private companies to walk away from, from encryption and commitments to encryption and privacy. Um, so I think I'm going to sort of end my, that's, that's a, yeah, and Keith says bulk searches for CSAM seems like the camel's nose under the tent to search all messages for any illegal content. I mean, we, we think that's true and, um, that'll happen pretty fast, I think, in, um, we don't know where, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think that's the case. And actually, I'm going to share one more blog post. And this is about, um, this is about Apple's program. This is written by Kurt, who's our EFF general counsel. Um, but he's saying how, you know, countries around the world have asked for access to and control over encrypted messages, and they're asking technology companies to nerd harder to somehow make things both encrypted, but also in a format so that they can read it. Um, and, you know, getting at some of, some of the dangers of that.
Okay, I think I'll take the um, uh, official Q and A out about five more minutes, unless we have no more questions, and then we can go into the the the, the informal part, and I'll turn off the recording. How's that? Sounds good to me. Are there any more questions, or would anybody like to turn on their microphone or put something else in the chat? Well, th thank you guys for saying you appreciate the work. I mean, I I really enjoy working on this because uh, even though it's it's frustrating in some ways because we repeat ourselves, um, it is. Uh, I think what's not frustrating about it and what's heartening is that um, it is an issue where I think more and more people get it. And we have kind of a growing group of of people that are that are with us on this issue, and um, Well, it's been great talking to you guys. Um, do you want me to, uh, Scott, do you want me to hang out for another minute or how do you want to wrap up? Yeah, the, let me go ahead and wrap this up as far as the recording. Uh, mm -hmm. And then if you could just hang out a few more minutes. Um, sure, I'm happy to, yeah. So, uh, yeah, again, I want to I want to thank you very much for, for um, coming out virtually at least. And yeah. uh, uh, it does it does broaden the, uh, the audience and, and the, the, the range of speakers. So thank you very much for this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording and the stream at this time.